I hope that uh, today, uh, through uh, the preaching of this text, that we will get the gist of what God is saying here, the gravity of this text. Um, this is one of those texts where in our reading of the Old Testament, many times we, it's like a cloud sometimes when we're reading the Old Testament. Uh, we, we get caught up in the names and the genealogies and the begots and the, all the, the names that we can't pronounce. And sometimes it gets really confusing. I hope to bring some clarity to these first five verses of chapter 2 because this is one of those instances where what God says, it's one of those occasions where you should be able to hear a pin drop after he says what he says. It's one of those occasions where in the vernacular of our day, one through five is God dropping the mic and walking off. And so I, I think we need to really get the gravity of what he is saying because what he is saying is significant for not only them, it's significant for us and it's significant for both time and eternity. Several years ago, Terry and I had the privilege of vacationing and uh, we had the privilege of going to the Grand Canyon. If you've ever been there uh, to the Grand Canyon, you will notice that there are many warning signs. There are signs, uh, one that I remember vividly was one that said, do not approach the edge. Well, I accepted that truth for several reasons. I've listed uh, a few. In many places, there are no railings. Uh, in many places, there are extreme gusts of winds. In many places, the uh, loose rock uh, leads to uh, bad footing. And the most significant reason is the 1500 foot drop to the canyon below. Yet people reject the truth, they rebel, and ultimately they will pay the price. Since that park has opened, 125 people have plummeted to their death because they refused to listen to the warning that was put before them, do not approach the edge. As a believer, uh, how do I respond to the rejection of the truth? How do you respond to the rejection of the truth? That's what Micah's working through here in this second chapter. Micah asks the same question. And though our cultures differ vastly, the human heart is exactly the same now as it was then. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than anything and incurable. Who can understand it? If you go back to chapter 1 and you look at verse 8, we realize that the condition of uh, his country, Micah's heart, was broken. He used the word lament. And obviously from reading that text, we also understand that not only is the prophet's heart broken for the condition of his country, but God's heart is broken because of the condition of his people. And as we looked at that, we came to understand our heart should be broken as well because of sin and the consequences of sin. Verse 9, he gave us the reason there in chapter 1, and that is that sin and its consequences, he said, are an incurable Injury, an incurable injury. And of course, we know that that is only from man's perspective because from God's perspective, everything is curable because of Jesus. And Jesus can make all things right. And I am trusting and I am hoping that Jesus has made all things right in, in, in every heart here today. And so as I think about the heart, and Jeremiah says the heart is desperately wicked, who can know it? Jesus also spoke about that in Matthew 22. The, the Pharisees, the uh, experts in the law, the experts in the Bible, asked Jesus, could you summarize all of God's Word in just a few words? And here's what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second 
is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And yet, as we see here in the text, and by and large, in the Old Testament, sometimes we say things like this. Well, it had come to pass, and in the days of Jesus, he addressed this problem. Well, what Jesus addresses in the New Testament, it was the same problem in the Old Testament. People had replaced the love of God and the love of neighbor with doing their duty. I want to speak to that just a little bit today because I'm pretty sure that there are some in this congregation today that are all about fulfilling their moral obligation to God. Your duty. Now, fulfilling our moral obligations to God are important. But if it doesn't have love with it, then as Paul said, it's sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. While duty demands I follow through, I strive to do everything that I do on the basis of love. Can you just hear these people in the Old Testament? Man, we got to go offer a sacrifice at the house of the Lord again. I got to go to the tabernacle one more time. I got to go hear the priest preach. The Philistines aren't that way. They don't have to do that, and yet God requires all of these things that we must do. So I guess we'll just do it because it's certainly a pain serving the Lord. Now, you say, you're being facetious. Maybe. But then again, that is the attitude of the people of the Old Testament. They have replaced their duty and they have totally foregone the love of God and the love of their neighbor. In chapter 1, the sins of all the people of God are in view. That's both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. In chapter 2, it's the people of Judah that Micah is addressing. God's judgment on Israel should have gotten the attention of the nation of Judah, and they should have heeded the warning of God. God's model is not being used at all in any way, shape, or form as we get to the book of Micah, and so people are going to fall. In chapter 1, it is demonstrated that the people have rejected their God. How do I know that? They have rejected their God because they have replaced God with idols. It's not as if they turned their back on God, even though if some of them may have. It's not that they turned their back on God. It's as if they have said this, God, would you just scoot over a little bit? I have these other things that I want to worship that are just as important as you. You're not central in my life. You're not number one in my life. And so that's where we find the people in Micah's day. And maybe that's where we find ourselves at Southside Baptist Church this morning. Amen? And so in chapter 2, Micah is going to demonstrate that the rejection of God's commands are the reason for the consequences that they are about to face and are facing. So, Micah demonstrated that their rejection of God's commands is the cause of their devastation. It's not God's fault. It is their fault that they are going to suffer what they are going to suffer. And in chapter 2, there's going to be two reasons. Today we're going to cover the first reason in verses 1 through 5. God's sovereign plans will prevail over man's evil schemes. Whatever we may scheme, whatever we, we may plot, God's plan will prevail. 
God's plan will supersede all of that. And so I'm going to give you four significant insights into understanding God's commands and his plans. God's commands and his plans. So generally speaking, in chapter 1, God spoke about their sin. He, he referred to it as idolatry. He referred to it as rebellion. And he also referred to it as sin. See chapter 1, verse 5. Now, if you go to Google, how many of you Google? Uh, a few of us. Uh, most of us know what that means. You get on the computer and you search something out. If you Google something, and I'm quite sure even if you went to uh, the, uh, the high school and looked at a history book, a world history book, and you looked at this event, it would say something along the lines of this. Israel was invaded and they were conquered because of the imperialism of Assyria. And they will count that as the historical fact for the fall of the nation of Israel. Well, God does not look at history the same way that men look at history. Whereas Google or a world history book may record that as Assyria's imperialism, God, quite frankly, in his history book, says it's not Assyria's imperialism that is the reason for their fall. The reason for their fall is the disobedience of the people of God. You won't find that in history books. You won't find that on Google. God says the reason that they fell is because they disobeyed my direct commands. So here's the first point. Picking up on the, uh, my Grand Canyon analogy, do not approach the edge. Choose God's truth over deceit. Choose God's truth over deceit. So I've uh, put up a, a graphic for today. I usually don't do this, but I think it would be beneficial for us in understanding Micah. Obviously, you can tell where I'm going with this. Those are two tablets of stone. What was written on two tablets of stone? The Ten Commandments. You know, you can divide the Ten Commandments up into two portions. Uh, the first portion are the things that tell us how we relate to God. Uh, those are the first four commands. Do not have other gods beside me. Do not make an idol for yourself. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, which, by the way, doesn't just mean God with an expletive. It means to use God's in name in any way that is light or inappropriate. Four, keep the Sabbath day holy. So all of those commands have to do with how we and they, as God's people, relate to him. Now, the second half have to do with how we relate to one another. We're familiar with these, right? Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Don't lie. Do not covet your neighbor's belongings. So the first four, how we relate to God. The last six, how we relate to one another. Now, chapter 1 told me this, that they had replaced God with idols. <laughs> Every one of these on the left-hand side, they have violated. Do not have any other gods before me. Do not make an idol of yourself. Do not misuse the name of the Lord, your God. Keep the Sabbath day holy. They have misused, abused, misappropriated, disobeyed all of these. Now, in light of that, <clears throat> the six that follow, it goes without saying. If you're not going to honor God, you're not going to honor men. If you don't value God, 
you're not going to value men. Jesus is the Son of God. But do you see what Jesus did? When he said, here's the summarization of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul. And then the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. There, there it is. And then, love your neighbor as yourself. See, the problem in Micah is that the first half of the commands, they have totally disobeyed. They've, they've chunked them aside. And so in light of that, if you don't value God, you're not going to value people. You are not going to love your neighbor as yourself, and you are going to treat them however you choose to treat them, because after all, there is no God to answer to. And so that's where we find ourselves in the book of Micah. And so with verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, Woe to those who dream up wickedness and prepare evil plans on their beds. At morning light, they accomplish it because the power is in their hands. That's the equivalent of our saying, might makes right. Might makes right. You could actually put that in a parenthesis if you would like. They are neither restrained by God because they've replaced him with idols. They are not restrained by God or his justice. They don't love God and hence they don't love their fellow man. So could you, could you help me with a modern day analogy? I thought and I thought and I thought I've thought of one, but I think it fails because I'm going to go ahead and share it. But I think in Micah's day, it would be 20 times magnified. You know, when you think about Washington, D.C., and you think about the people that represent us, and you think about the politicians, and how they, they make long and lofty speeches about the plight of the poor and how despicable that is and how the other party is so detached and it makes no difference which party's talking how the other party is detached from the people and they talk about you know, people are starving to death and people are homeless and people are this and they are that. And we hear that and then all of a sudden we hear from Washington, D.C. that they gave themselves a big fat raise. Now, how does that affect you? It ticks you off. That's what it does. They talk out of one side of their mouth this way, but then they, they give themselves a race. That's what's going on in Micah, except ten times magnified. The, the leaders aren't leading. And the leaders that are supposed to be following God aren't following God because they've replaced him. And they've thrown him away as if, he, as if he is some piece of garbage. And so chapter 2, verse 1, he begins with this word, woe, your Bible may say, alas, or ha, it's, it's an announcement of punishment because of the guilt of their sin. It says they dream up wickedness. They prepare and work out these things. And the verb actually has the connotation of they're not just opportunistic. These are premeditated acts. They sit on their bed and they think at night all the ways I can swindle people out of everything that they have. Love your neighbor as yourself. At morning, when it says... Uh, what are those who dream of wickedness, prepare evil plans on their beds? At morning light, they accomplish, has the idea of continuing action, which means this is what they do for a living. They sit on their beds at night, 
and they think about ways to mistreat people. It's not a once in a blue moon thing. This is what their life consists of. And it says it's because might makes right or the power is in their hands. Just because you have the might, that doesn't make it right. Because ultimately, there's a God that you have to answer to. Ultimately, there's a God that you have to answer to, which leads to the second point. Don't approach the edge. Love your neighbor supremely. Love your neighbor supremely. Look at some of these words he uses in verse 2. They covet fields, and they seize them. They also take houses. <coughs> uh, that word can be used... Uh, for family, it can be used for inheritance, any of those. They take houses. They deprive a man of his home, a person of his inheritance. Now, we as Christians, we would say the golden rule is to uh, treat others as you would be treated, right? Uh, they use the golden rule of the world, which says whoever has the gold makes the rules. But there's still a God that you have to answer to. When it says simply, they covet fields and seize them, I don't think we in our culture can really grasp the nature of that. God promised Abraham several things. And one of the things that he promised him that was significant was a land. A land for his offspring. A promise that God made. The importance of land here and the fact that people are just snatching it up and taking it from others, there is no way that I can overestimate the value of the depravity of what is going on here. The, their inheritance is now in the hands of greedy, wealthy exploiters. And Micah, who, by the way, is a country bumpkin, uh, there are two, two prophets that rose up together, Isaiah and Micah. Isaiah is, quite frankly, the city slicker, and Micah is the country bumpkin. And Micah has seen this as a person living with the poor, he has seen this over and over and over again. You know, chapter 1, he just said, you've sinned, you've rebelled. But in chapter 2, he gets down to specifics. Uh, they violated the Tenth Command, uh, which has to do with coveting those things that belong to your neighbor. They have violated the eighth command, which had to do with stealing. Verse 9 actually says that they stole. You want to know how low they sunk? They stole from the widows their homes. Verse 9. They broke in the second greatest command, which is to love their neighbor as themselves. And they violated the ninth command, which we're not in that part of the text yet, but the ninth command, they lied, verse 11. And so we need to not only choose God's truth over deceit, we need to love our neighbor supremely. Third, do not approach the edge. Believe God's sovereign plan will prevail. Therefore, verse 3. That's a simple enough word, and when we're reading the Apostle Paul, we know what that means. When there's a therefore, you want to know what it's there for. And so we think of a word like because. I'm saying all this because. And so we look at verse 3, and we might just insert the word because there. But it's really more than a because. It's a, it's a shocking statement from the Lord. It's as if the Lord is going to say something along the lines of this. Oh my goodness, the Lord says. It's a, it's a 
expression of utter shock at what the Lord is going to do. Oh my goodness, the Lord says. I am now planning a disaster, a calamity against this nation or family. You cannot free your necks from it. Then you will not walk so proudly because it will be an evil time. Like a yoke that's placed on the back of, a, of an ox or an oxen, you're not going to be able to get out of it, God says. There is absolutely no way of escape. Those who will not bend to God's easy yoke, Matthew chapter 11, they shall feel his iron yoke. Proverbs 29 verse 1. One who becomes stiff-necked after many reprimands will be shattered instantly without recovery. Mm. See, the irony here is that evil human beings plan, verse 1, so too God plans. And people will reap what they sow. You will notice it says there, this disaster is coming against the nation. Well, not everybody in the nation is guilty. There are some followers of the Lord. There are some with love for God and love for neighbor. But you know what? God says they are going to pay the price with the whole. The innocent part will pay the price with the whole. Verse 4, in that day, one will take up a taunt against you and lament mournfully, saying, we are totally ruined. He measures out the allotted lands of my people. How he removes it from me, he allots our fields to traitors. They are judged by God, and then they're going to be ridiculed by others. Just as their victims weep, God says they're going to weep just like that. God's going to remove his hand of blessing, including their land that he promised through Abraham. He's going to remove that blessing, and here's what he's going to do. Don't miss this. He is going to give the land of God's people to apostates, to the lost. He calls them here traitors. They lament. They're not sorry for their actions. They're sorry for the consequences of the sin that they have chosen. The irony is this. <laughs> the rich and the powerful are actually calling the invaders land grabbers, which is the very sin that they were guilty of. Now, verse 5. Here's where God drops the mic. Here's where the pen should fall and everybody should be able to hear it. This is, the, this is a pinnacle of the Old Testament right here. Therefore, there will be no one in the assembly of the Lord the covenant nation of God, Israel. There will be no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by casting lots. What he's referring to is back to the book of Joshua. When they came into the promised land, the 12 tribes of Israel divided up the land by the casting of lots. The passage implies that this is well beyond those blessings and cursings that God gave in the book of Deuteronomy, where it says uh, he will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the next generation and the subsequent generations to follow. It is way beyond that. Because what God is saying here is this. This is permanent. This is transgenerational. The judgment that is about to fall on the people of God is going to fall and there will be no point of return. Henceforth, every since then, 
There has always been somebody telling the people of God, Israel, what to do. He says from this point on, you're on your own. No one could divide the land. And you know why? Because no one's going to be there. No one can divide the land because they're all going to be gone. They'll either be dead or they'll be taken into captivity. Here's God's justice. It's an eye for an eye. They had taken land from their countrymen greedily and illegally so God would take their land from them and let others occupy it. Mm. Do you get the gravity of that? That's a sin that they are not going to recover from as a nation. They have replaced God with whatever. It makes no difference. But they have replaced God. And therefore, they treat people however they want to treat them. Because in the end, if you've replaced God, there is no one to answer to in the end. And you can do whatever you want to do. So believer, are you approaching the edge of God's judgment? Maybe you're not worshiping idols, but maybe you've told God, why don't you scoot over? I have these other things that are on my agenda. Here's what you need to do. I'm not a deep thinker. I'm kind of simple. Here's what we need to do. We just need to fix it. How do I fix it? <laughs> Lamentations 340. Let us examine and probe our ways and turn back to God. It's just as simple as that. It's not, it's not rocket science. We just need to look, look inwardly at ourselves and see where we're at. And if we need fixing, we need to let God fix it. Lost person, are you approaching the edge of judgment? Here's what you need to do. You need to let God rescue you. Now, here's the real truth. That analogy breaks down. Because it would suppose, well, as long as you stay away from the edge, you're okay. But the Bible says that you've already stumbled off the edge and you are falling. So much so that John 3, 18 which is only two verses removed from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Two verses later, he says this, Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. You've already stumbled over the side. You're already falling. The condemnation of God is on you. The judgment has fallen. All you need to do now, you can't trust in the bottom. That's not a pleasant outcome. All you can trust in is that God will catch you. And you need to ask Him to catch you.